to have the opportunity to kick off this conversation around something so important 
such as local journalism and the role that we play as local journalists in our communities. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about VoteBeat. Um, VoteBeat is a brand new newsroom. Um, we are based out of Texas, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Arizona. We're hoping to expand. Uh, we focus solely on election administration and voting access. We don't cover any politics or anything like that. We just focus on election administration. Our main sources are election election administrators at the local level. Uh, so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the first story actually that I got to work on for VoteBeat when I joined this newsroom, which is actually the only newsroom in the country covering this topic. So I'm really honored to be part of this. Um, so the first story that I got to cover uh, working as a reporter for VoteBeat uh, was actually a story out of Tarrant County, out of Fort Worth. Um, in the course of my uh, sourcing and reporting that I started doing earlier this summer, I started calling election administrators around the state. And a lot of my questions, you know, kind of were around um, how we as a newsroom and as journalists can help readers better understand the process of elections, but also how we could better help them understand what was happening right now. Um, around misinformation, right? So Haider Garcia, the election administrator in Tarrant County, shared with me this tip. Um, he said that as we actually were speaking, there was a group of people, about a dozen people that were in the election administration office in Tarrant County uh, who were auditing, hand counting, thousands of ballots from the March 2020 primary. So. This was a story that Vopi just wanted, we wanted to focus on, we wanted to really cover. And so I spent time there with Haider Garcia at the election administration office. I talked to that group of people. I asked them what they were doing, why they were doing it, what they were looking for. And they told me they just wanted to do their own audit because they didn't think um, the results were right. They wanted to compare them to what the Secretary of State, the State Office, had published on their website, and they wanted to make sure that you know the about that everything kind of matched. And so we did a story around that. And um, Hyder Garcia also told us a little bit about what he went through to kind of facilitate that um, that action from that group of people to kind of facilitate that audit. Um, he had to have someone from his staff in that room with a group of people at all times, which took resources, right? He also um, had to draft a policy of rules so what those people could and couldn't do while they were doing that counting of the ballot. So also that took time and resources. So um, once the story uh, went live, once we published it, we published it on a Friday night, uh, it immediately went viral. Um, it was such a good example of something that was happening at the local level, but that was um, an example of just a bigger issue of something that was happening uh, at the state level, which is why our partner, the Texas Tribune, was also so interested in that story and they republished it. Um, but also, it, you know, uh, several days later, we noticed that it started making national news and it also other publication or uh, publications around the world were also picking it up. So this was just such a good example of a story that was very much local, that was very much happening in Tarrant County, but that was a good example of a bigger problem and a bigger issue around misinformation that was happening not just across the state, but everywhere else across the nation. Uh, for us at VoteBeat, it was also another good example of why our newsroom exists and why we cover elections at the local level. Um, these decisions around elections and um, around the process happen at the county level, right? Uh, we are the local reporters. We are the ones that are watching, watching the uh, county commissioner court meetings when they're approving that funding every year, right? We are the ones that are there watching how much money the county is going to spend on elections. Are, gonna, are they going to upgrade the system? Are they going to, are they going to, you know, approve funding for more staffing? You know, all of those decisions play out um, way before an election starts. So that's why we're here and why we think it's so important to cover these issues around elections 
at the local level. Um, and so I'm really just excited to be here. This was just one example that I that we wanted to share as part of Vote Beat um, in our mission and why we're here. I'm so excited to get to do this work in my home state in Texas. I'm so excited that I get to cover issues happening out of Tarrant County around elections. Um, I attended the University of Texas at Arlington briefly, but I lived in the Dallas-Fort Worth area um, and I drove around from Arlington to Fort Worth uh, often. So that area has a very special place in my heart. So I just also wanted to share that with all of you, but um, I just wanted to also share just kind of a little bit more of our mission and why Vote Beat is here. Um, so excited to see all of the other uh, local uh, newsrooms that are part of this event. And so I just wanted to uh, just share again how excited and grateful I am that you gave me this opportunity just to share this story. Uh, please, if you have any questions or any comments, you know, around the, around the work that we're doing, if you want to work together in any way, please send me an email. You can find me on Twitter as well. I'll share that with you. Um, I want to hear from you and I hope that you really enjoy this conversation and I'm looking forward to just hearing about it and I hope that you uh, send me a tweet uh, with your thoughts. Thank you so much. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Thanks again, for everybody, for, uh, for showing up uh, for this uh, important conversation. Uh, we're hoping to have a pretty spirited discussion and maybe get some insights from these great journalists on, on, on the topic. Uh, something that I think is really, really important specifically because we're entering, or we are already in an election cycle, uh, and, and the topic of uh, misinformation and, and information obviously is something that, uh, at least in, in our newsrooms, uh, I'm sure, uh, in, in the classroom as well, Jim and Marie, you guys talk about probably a lot. Um, I know we do over at the CBS level. I want to start with um, the question, and we'll just address it, maybe we can start with Jake and come down this way. Um, talking a little bit about um, local journalists, you know, we're, we, we are sort of positioned uniquely within the community to have these sort of connections that I think a lot of times maybe uh, journalists at a national level or, or folks who even work regionally, they're not as connected as we are. Um, and I just kind of want to ask you guys, why do you think that's sort of important in, in maintaining the quality of the journalism and the information that we're sharing and to stay connected with these communities that are on their way to go vote. Well, we live and have fun, shop, work in these communities. So we have a deeper connection to these people. And, you know, there's a chance I'd go to a grocery store, I'd run to someone who I talked to a day ago or a week ago, right? So we're building these much stronger connections that natural reporters never get a chance to build. And because we're here, you know, they turn to us. They, they trust us, they see us, they see that we actually care about this community because we live here. Like, this is our home. So, we want to see it do better, just like they want to see it do better. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think, like, CNN and the New York Times are here every day. They're here if something huge happens, and it's oftentimes they hear about it because a local reporter has reported on it. And then a national outlet picks it up. So, I, I, I mean, I totally agree. Like, Beyond like the giant controversies, like local news outlets are the ones that are here talking about county commissioners or county judge, right? And kind of in those smaller, more local races where you see a lot of the same problems as with the big national races, um, reflected on this smaller scale, the same levels of disinformation, the same levels of lying or you know misrepresentations by candidates, and kind of the local reporters are the only ones who are going to talk about it, right? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Do you worry? Uh, there's always been a difference between being a local reporter and a national reporter. Um, I started my career in the Wall Street Journal and it lasted 18 months. And the reason I left was because I was disconnected from the community. Yeah. Um, I was covering agriculture and financial futures and buying farmers. Um, and that had nothing to do with the world that I lived in. Part of their community if they're willing to just dig their heels in under 
understand policy, not so much politics, but really give people the information that they need to know on a daily basis. Now, I don't know for you all, but one of the things that I have found, especially when you're local and you're so easily accessible, is that people keep us in check as well. <laughs> I don't know if your experience is just it's sort of, uh, if you share that, uh, but I know that a lot of times, you know, uh, it, it is sort of a back and forth, a two-way conversation a lot of times that we're having with our, with our audiences, the people who are consuming uh, the information that we're putting back out there. And sometimes that sort of thing keeps us humble, but it also makes sure that we're putting out information that, you know, is, is in fact correct. Um, and, and, and I bring that up because it's sort of a pivot into the next uh, sort of point that I want to make here, and that is with information nowadays, with way that folks consume, the speed at which we consume the information now, uh, the different platforms and places where you can get this information from, a lot of this makes it so that disinformation can thrive, right? So uh, I'm wondering, how, what are your thoughts on how do we battle that? Because on one side, the same things that are making information sharing great are also the things that could potentially be harming what, what we're trying to do here. Um, so the, the question then just becomes, um, uh, I'll start with you, Jim Marie, if you, if, if you would, how do we fight that? You fight it with the truth. Um, and you fight it that on. A lot of times we, in some ways, we might not commit the mortal sin, but we commit the medial sin. Or we repeat the mortal sin so many times that we might as well with us and hold it. Yeah. Um, as opposed to just figuring it out and telling the truth. I, I've been talking to students since before the 2020 election about voter fraud. And, and I've said to them, do you understand how people vote in this country? Do you understand how decentralized it is and how difficult it is to actually commit fraud when they don't even have the same machines in Dallas County that we have in Tarrant County, much less Parker County? And they'll look at you and they'll like, really? And, and you can explain it, but that's not something that we always explain. We're too busy covering the fight over whether or not there was fraud instead of saying, well, let's deconstruct this and figure out if there could be fraud. I mean, our election system is just so decentralized. It's, it's amazing that no one has really just started talking to people about that. I've told people how the process works, and I just walk them through it. Now, if they haven't 
questions, I just ask them, I answer them, and let them talk. We just have a conversation. Sometimes it's self record sometimes it's not. It doesn't begin to the story all the time, but, you know, I, if I'm able to help them for one person, yeah. that person can hopefully go tell their friend, here's how things work, and then we kind of go on that. And, and again, that, that, that speaks to what you all mentioned about the power of being connected into these communities and living in the communities that you cover. Um, I don't know how you all feel about this, but, but, but uh, on, on the topic of misinformation and disinformation, I feel like a lot of times uh, the communities that tend to lose the most are, are marginalized communities, uh, minority communities, communities of color. Um, I think of the things that, you know, uh, my parents probably fall for sometimes. My grandparents, you know, they call me and ask me a lot of times because I'm their source to verify everything, even if I don't know. I have to Google search something for them. But, I think what happens is they're used to um, the news being some form of authority and they just kind of believe what they hear and they're just used to that. Uh, and, and, and I think for me, it, and, and what I've noticed is it comes down to access. And do these communities have access to the proper tools to fact check something? Do they have the resources uh, to, to, to be able to call someone or somebody out? And, and that's why I feel like sometimes you know, communities that are just struggling to get by uh, and, and to be seen maybe have the hardest time with this and perhaps are the easiest to influence. I mean, have you all noticed that? Yeah, yeah, so you know, I think the best part about our news organization is we're free. So that's a huge barrier that's removed. You know, I you know, I have the tools to access stuff, but sometimes I don't have the funds to get behind a paintball. You know, I do love journalism. A lot of great journalism, but we're talking about any of these people in our communities. They can't. That's not their top priority. You know, they're worried about putting food on the table, you know, get the kids to school, or whatever it may be. There are bigger issues. But just giving them that slight little advantage of here's some news, it's free, is a huge step for that. Now, the hard part is getting in front of them, and yeah. that's something that we're trying to do. So we just go out to the community, we talk to people. You know, sometimes we interview people, sometimes just tell people what we do, and just having that conversation. I think everything that we're talking about today goes back to having that community conversation. Whether it's just one-on-one, -on -one, what we're doing here, it all goes back to that. Yeah, I agree. I think I think about language a lot, too. Um, and at least in, like, you know, we write for English language news organizations, and obviously it's a huge lift and a huge decision to decide, like, we're going to be bilingual English and Spanish news from now on. I, like, doubt that's going to happen, but I think that there are ways that primarily English language newsrooms can, you know, for example, with KERA, for every election, we put together these, like, voter guides. They're awesome. It's, like, every single city in North Texas, where you can go vote, what the hours are, where to find your polling stations, kind of like a one-stop shop so if you Google where to go vote, you can find it. What if we like hired a translator a few times a year and at least like made that resource available in a variety of languages? I think that in and of itself would be awesome because I mean I get emails from people all the time being like, where do I find voter information? Yeah. Because they come to me instead of Jim Murray, I want to uh, ask of you, um, obviously you've had a, a long or successful career at the New York Times, obviously you're working in uh, local communities as well, but the difference between the rest of us is that you're also a professor, and you, you are every day dealing with the next generation of journalists that are coming up. What do you sort of feel their concerns are, and what's working with the next generation coming up, and what's, and what's not, you think? Well, I think we just have to understand that they want to get in want to tell stories. And this is about storytelling and the old way of doing it has really to tell a story. Uh, but we don't, don't recognize there are now many, many more ways to tell a story. And we've got to encourage them to learn how to tell that story. Where journalism kind of lost a step is while the misinformation folks and everybody else was out there learning how to use Facebook and Twitter and putting information on social media, and we were still staying, staying arguing as to whether or not the internet was going to stick around, um, 
And that, I mean, how often is that happening? You're seeing with, with this generation. I hear students that talk. They they may not talk about getting this information, but I know they'll talk about Twitter and what they saw on Twitter. Um, what they saw on
exposed things are like extremely necessary and but sometimes it's just harder to get that information out of people and it's harder to get people to talk about real things i think one way that i approach that as a reporter is just like you don't need to talk to me <laughs> all the time you know what i can ask you for comment and it is well within your rights to say like you know you don't want to comment but that doesn't mean i can't do a ton of reporting outside and present my findings regardless of what you decide to say or not say um so for example like if i'm doing a story about the election and I'm talking about misinformation and I'm citing examples of misinformation that a candidate is talking about. A lot of people candidates say, well, why yes, Lord, and I'm spreading misinformation in the story. I can just do a ton of reporting around that. So I think it's important just because like we're taxpayers, like I know that's a, a platitude, but like we pay their salaries and we elect them and they should respond to people. And, and I'm just gonna play devil's advocate right here because um, I think we're all you know like-minded journalists in that we understand the power and the importance of holding people accountable. But what do you say to those that say, we just do it as a matter of shtick to get views and clicks and a bigger audience, and really just to piss people off? <laughs> I think that if it pisses people off, that can be good. <laughs> I, think, I think it can be good. I think mean, there should, sometimes should be conflict. I think there should be arguments about the way that things are done. And I think that if people are reading a story, it's because they care about how they're governed. Like, if it's a well-reported story that's fair and factual, and a lot of people are reading it, I don't think you can call that clickbait. I think you can call it a well-reported story that people are like, dang, I'm glad that I know that now because this report wrote about it. And if she wrote a great story, people read it, and they click on it, it is. <laughs> You know, um, I'll just share a, a quick example. Obviously, the, the big news that uh, many of us journalists uh, have been covering over the summer was what happened in Uvalde. And, and of course, that's an ongoing story because it just seems like every time you turn a corner, something else is happening to those folks. And you want to talk about leaders not talking, and you want to talk about people shutting up, and I scratch your back and you scratch mine, and not talking to the media. I cannot think of a more egregious example at least in modern days, uh, than, than Uvalde when it comes to a community that doesn't respect uh, and understand the importance of what we do as, as, as journalists. Uh, and, and, and I just think that for the folks who live there, they're the ones that stand to, to, to lose the most in all of this. Um, because I, I can't tell you how many times about phone calls, as soon as I identify who I am, phone call gets you know, uh, and, and hung up. Emails that don't get uh, received. Sometimes we have to we have to go down there in person and knock on doors. Uh, and still, uh, you hear the sort of the things that are happening down there. And I suspect you guys know what I'm talking about, right? And, and so I'm not going to get into all of that. Uh, but I just wanted to specifically outline that as an example. I think of of, of, of a community, you know, who has sort of um, a community of leaders who are sort of bonded together to to to, to make sure that we don't achieve our our, our objective of, of reporting. Uh, um, I want to ask you about, um, obviously we're observing Hispanic Heritage Month, um, diversity is, is top of mind right now, I think for so many people. Uh, I also think that across the country we're having these conversations a lot more. Um, and I know that, you know, again, you, you deal so much with, with uh, you know, with the Latino community, a big advocate for it. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the importance of making sure that our newsrooms are equally diverse as the communities of Israel. Because I, I can tell you, we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. We are even close. Newsrooms need to reflect the communities that they come right? Because we need to be able to have multiple people in the newsroom with multiple point of views to discuss stories. Um, the work I do with the Bayer Institute is basically talking about diversity and my fault lines are not Chris's fault lines, but if we're having a conversation, oftentimes we can recognize story through both of our fault lines. Uh, and you're, you're, when you talk about marginalized communities and misinformation and all that, it's not that these communities are newly marginalized. You're talking about communities that have never had adequate coverage. And now then you're realizing that they're really vulnerable because of all those years of neglect. Because uh, they're just belonging on to whatever but if you can't start breaking down the barriers and change the what American newsrooms look like, and our newsrooms are whiter than any other workspace. Uh, there's 
it's a conversation that we're having at, 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 at CBS. Candidly, something that was you know brought up about a year and a half ago. Um, I can tell you that um, a lot of the companies are, are making efforts to try and change that. Uh, but you know, I think what hap what happens at, in, in many places the, the absence of practicing diversity, equity, and inclusion on a daily basis sets yourself up for a, a situation where you're very reactive when the bomb explodes, right? When somebody calls you a racist, now you gotta fix a problem. Where if, if, as a matter of practice, you hire people that were reflective of your community and you kept this sort of atmosphere around all along, you're bulletproof from that kind of criticism, right? practice, right? And so it's not that you hire three people and then you get mad when they did better jobs and you're starting all over again yeah. because you weren't yeah. just continuing to hire a diverse group so uh, again, I, I know a lot of companies and media companies are, 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 are doing their best at this right now. How can we be better at that? And how can we, uh, as, as journalists, sort of help with that? You keep calling on it. Uh, I wouldn't say they're doing their best. If this is their best, they're doing it. Um, they are making baby steps and they're starting to do it. Um, but there's a long way to go. And it's not just about hiring people. It's giving them a seat at the table. It's listening to their voice once they're in the newsroom. It's all of those things. It's sometimes people get hired, but then when they go pitch stories, they're told, that's not a story. It, is, uh, they don't get promoted. Is it a matter then of steering young journalists, like when they come to you, steering them into a management track then? Or, or encouraging more reporters? Because I, what, what the criticism that I hear, and what I have seen with my own eyes, is that the decision makers are still the same people. They're just trying to maybe perhaps understand the issue a little bit more, but, this, but the people that are making the decisions are still the same folks. So do, do, we, do we need to create a pipeline of journalists that are a little bit more interested in management roles? Is, is that what it is? who are interested in management roles. It's a matter of are they getting hired into those management roles. It's, again, you've got the people at the top who are maintaining their, their power and their status quo, and it's incumbent on us to A lot of times, you still have these companies that are putting barriers up that limit people and their, and their access. Jacob and Brandon, I mean, what, what do you guys think is lost when, when newsrooms are not reflective of the communities that they serve? Yeah, so we kind of don't get the full picture of our community, right? So if we're only telling a certain segment of our community that story, the full picture. There's there's so much more to to communities than just that one thing. Um, I think what Jean Marie Brown was Jean Marie was saying. <laughs> so he's saying full name. Um, but what you were saying about barriers is so important. Let's, let's be honest. Journalism is there's, there's a lot of barriers in journalism. And if you're many come from wealthier families, it's okay. But for some people, that's not okay. Like, Internships often don't pay. You're starting to see a lot of that change. Right. I know I probably would be in terms of more for internships that pay me. And that's so key because it just gives people that taste like, oh, I can actually do this. I can actually get published in a medium sized publication or a bigger publication. And it gets them going down that path. But then the problem is when they want to go to a bigger publication, there's still those barriers. So we have to really get rid of those barriers. Change and that starts at the top. Yeah, no, I just I completely agree, and I think a lot of it, at least because I'm still pretty early in my career, right? And so I think a lot of what I see is like, at least in public radio, like public radio loves a fellowship. Like public radio loves a come work here for a year, get some bylines, get some experience, and that's right. Like I started my career in fellowships and actually had a really great experience, but I think it requires a very specific experience for it to be helpful like i'm frustrated when i see fellowships where then people struggle afterwards to find full-time work in journalism where they have a lack of mentorship especially when so many of those fellowships are focused on students of color right so like fresh graduates um, who are people of color i think that those fellowships need kind of a more like intense 
this mentorship and like job hunting component because like it's so hard to find a job in journalism. And if you're coming and tackling, you know, trying to find that first permanent full-time job, after a fellowship can be really hard. And I benefited so much from having that guidance in the fellowship I was in. So yeah, I think for newsrooms who have fellowship programs, it's just really, really, really important that they like take them really seriously. And if they're taking on this responsibility to train a young journalist, to be like, let's do this. <laughs> what do you want to be doing? Let's get you experience in that. Let's get you bylines. Let's get you production experience. And let's, you know, tailor your resume to get you a job after this week and hire you here. The guidance in the job once you have it. Yes. And have that open communication with your editor or producer. I think that's also very important. Because mm -hmm. it sets that expectation of what you're actually getting into. And you also have to examine fellowships. Because sometimes fellowships But they're using 
underlines this is that the skills that media companies won't pay for. Also so, so somebody will, and, 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 and handsomely too in some cases. And I think it also takes fresh blood, right? Fourth report, we didn't exist two years ago. And we kind of rethought how we approached journalism, right? All our, all our money is going towards the journalists, yeah. toward the product. And there's no overhead because we're online only. We basically so we have the site, we have our newsletters, we have the staff, and it's all focused towards one goal, and that's free journalism for everyone here in Fort Worth and Cherry County. And I I think we all believe in the report that nonprofit journalism really is the future in the that journalism is heading. And I've always been that since college. I've always been obsessed with nonprofit journalism and why I'm here. So. Well, and that's that's why I think we see such popularity with, uh, with you know the, the idea of independent journalism uh, uh, and people on social media. Oh, uh, right. right. We're a month away from the midterm election here. Uh, what are you all thinking going into this? Uh, how, how do you think this next month is going to play out as far as uh, journalism that's being practiced out there and, and, and how things are going to look between now and election day? Whoever wants to take that. I'll be uh, playing against the television, uh, <laughs> turning it off. Uh, I don't like horse races. I don't like horse races and cold weather. That's where we are about to head into. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be wishing for policy stories. Uh, I, I love elections, but what I don't like is after we cover the election, we kind of go back up to our home and wait for the grandma today. Instead of helping people understand that the reason your streets look like they do is because that's who we voted for for city council. Mm -hmm. The reason this doesn't work is because that's who we voted for for school board. Or, you know, we, we spend so much time worrying about who's the president instead of worrying about who's in the state legislature. Because they can, they can make your life miserable a lot faster. Yeah, and that's something that we've been very intentional with at the report. We've been very intentional in ensuring our election coverage is very policy focused. So, my colleague Rachel Ferry has written a lot about property taxes in the past month. Is it the sexiest topic? No, but it affects everyone, even runners. So, she's drilled down into the county judge candidates, policy proposals, until people hear what's actually going on and what they say is actually kind of hard to do. It's easier said than done. And that's what voters need to understand. And also, they also need to understand how these issues just aren't in silos. The county has property taxes, but that's not the biggest part of our bill. It's a school district. Yeah. So it's giving them all the information they need to understand that local politics affects them more than where is at the top. Well, uh, last month when Lynn Whitley decided he was going to endorse the Democrat for lieutenant governor, and he said because of property taxes, and I'm reading the Twitter tweet and everybody's screaming, we don't pay property taxes in Texas. And I'm like, no, we don't pay a lot of sales tax, and they keep it all in that rainy day fund, and it never sees the light of day. And I'm like, could somebody please tweet that? Because I don't know why talking about it. Does anybody have any questions that you want to ask a panelist or something you'd like to add personal experience at all? No? Anybody? Sandra, come on now. I'll I'll uh, I'll ask one um, because here's here's another thing that sort of uh, has become a topic of discussion, I think, for a lot of journalists and a lot of the uh, sort of content that we've been covering lately. Uh, a lot of it seems to be tied into traumatic events. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm wondering um, how you all deal with that, and, and Jim Marie, you know, what, what some of the students coming up might be thinking about uh, when, when you think about, you know, young journalists covering a Uvalde or, 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 or just even, even covering politics now. I mean, it's so polarized, it's so nasty. Uh, you know, but they can try. I mean, I had a long who was, was in Uvalde and I checked on her. Um, but today, as we were bring some of the stories, I I'll just to figure out to do a story of the purple in it. And they were just shocked that I said, well, that, no, that's a story because this school's purple. But you have to have fun. Yes, you're, you've got tragedy, you've got policy, you've got all those things. I had an editor who used to say, if every day you went to the, the fence and your neighbor told you everything that was wrong, you'd stop going to the fence after a while. <laughs> but if some days when you go to the fence, your neighbor says, tells you a joke or tells you a funny story, then the next day he tells you the tragedy. You will 